Hello, everyone. Welcome to a, a very special meeting tonight. Uh, Chippy, or the Chicago Python User Group, and uh, IndiePy, the Indianap Indianapolis uh, Python User Group, are joining forces to uh, provide you a, uh, um, a combined meeting. I would like to introduce to you uh, my co-host, uh, Calvin Hendricks Parker. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Jasinski, and, and today we'll be um, walking you through um, uh, walking you through some awesome talks and in, in the main meeting. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. I'm super excited to be here with the Chippy folks. Um, I've met many of you at PyCons over the years, so it's super exciting to actually be a part of the meeting this time. And I'm we're really excited to have you here, too. And um, Calvin's also uh, uh, gonna, going to be speaking with us as well. Doing I know, a man, man of many talents. So I just lost my window. Here we go. For uh, <laughs> there, there we go. For the slideshow. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to talk about our code of conducts. Each of our groups have a code of conduct, which um, uh, if you could take a look at on our, our respective websites, um, and basically uh, indicates how you should uh, kind of behave to each other in person and on these online events. So, so please check those out and uh, be, be good to each other. Uh, so what is Chippy? First, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Chippy. Chippy is the Chicago Python user group. Uh, we started in 2003 and um, met in the back of a, a small bar and, and have grown to be, you know, very large with lots of different um, communities and, um, you know, Slack channel and um, and Meetup and so um, uh, we've really uh, seen some growth and um, uh, we are striving to support Python in the Chicago area. So IndiePy, we found it in 2007, just a few short years later. Uh, I was reaching out and trying to find where the tech geeks were all hanging out in Indy, and there I couldn't find it. So I went ahead and built a community around it myself. So I'm one of the founders of IndiePy itself. Uh, we've been doing awesome things like some uh, quarterly conferences over the years, uh, putting together some pythologies, and basically just trying to build that community here in Indianapolis. And I, I think we've done some pretty awesome stuff and connected a lot of awesome people. And so I think the uh, it goes without saying that uh, these are volunteer organizations, and uh, you know all the people that help make these events possible um, are we're, we're in tremendous debt to them. We have a board member, um, a group of board members um, here, which um, uh, make sure they're, they're the ones that lose the sleep over making sure the events happen. And uh, but we have uh, various other uh, organizers and special interest groups uh, that uh, are organizers that that contribute in various ways. And I don't yeah. know. If, yeah. Well, same thing for IndiePy. Uh, a lot of the folks are sixties uh, as we call ourselves from six feet up. And so I think their tireless efforts to make IndiePy awesome. Cause if it was just up to me, it probably wouldn't go very far. And so thanks to like Laura and Mary Bath, uh, we have an awesome group and it's always been a team effort uh, ever since 2007. And this also, uh, these events couldn't happen without our sponsors. Uh, we'd like to thank our, our sponsors, Braintree, Zorro, and JFrog. Yeah, yeah and then Nipai, we also have sponsorship. We've got uh, Six Feet Up, who's, um, I'm the co-founder of that as well. We're a Python and cloud consulting company. And then JetBrains is one of our platinum sponsors. And J JFrog joined us as well uh, last year as a sponsor. So I'm super excited to have them all along. So I'd like to bring on... Um, Ari Waller from JFrog to give a quick announcement. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's great to be uh, it's great to be here at such an awesome event. Um, uh, you know, hi everybody. For those who don't know me, I am Ari Waller, and I'm the Meetup Event Manager for JFrog. And we are really honored to be both an annual sponsor for both Chippy and IndiePy. This makes it very exciting uh, to be really part of two model Python communities. Uh, part of my job is uh, interacting with a lot of the meetup communities around the globe and uh, the Python uh, meetups. Uh, it's great when I think of uh, some of the some of the way that they're organized and the content. Um, I always look at uh, I, I always really look at both uh, Chippy and IndiePy as just really truly being model in terms of uh, what they do for their community. So, guys, thanks for you to you and your teams for everything that you do. Oh, are you going to make us blush? Well, you know, I don't. I just, I just speak the truth. Actually, we've been really fortunate. The Python communities that JFrog sponsors, we have about four actually uh, across the country. 
Um, and uh, really, they're just uh, really, really well run. And we're just, uh, it, it really makes for an awesome community, even during this pandemic. Um, I'll share just a little bit about who we are. Uh, JFrog, we are the DevOps software company. We were founded in 2008. Many people in the DevOps community know us best by our flagship product, Artifactory, which is considered by many to be the gold standard for managing your artifacts and dependencies. But here is something that many in the Python community do not know yet. JFrog does have a free cloud version of our software available to you to use for your projects, especially for the Python meetup community. And um, if, the, if there are here, people here working with Docker, as I know many of you are, JFrog's free tier on the cloud is capable of functioning, functioning rather as a pull-through cache for Docker Hub. And since JFrog has partnered with Docker, you'll also be exempt from their rate limits on pulls from free or anonymous accounts. So hopefully that can be approved to be pretty valuable uh, for those who want to use it and also have a free tool to work with with some of those projects. Now I'm going to drop a link in the, a link in the chat, or actually I shouldn't say I, Joe, when, uh, after I'm finished, mm -hmm. if you don't mind dropping that link in the chat, but uh, just as, ex just as, and maybe even more exciting for me tonight, I'm going to share my screen if I can. I'm going to see here. Still the, most, still the most challenging part of the online meetup is the screen share. <laughs> so um, here we go. Awesome. So another bonus for tonight is our raffle just for attendees. Uh, JFrog's going to give you a chance to enter and win one of three prizes. So each month we give away um, an Azure Fruit product, whether it's a Clue or a Kitten Bot. I think the Kitten Bot was your idea, Calvin at both Chippy and uh, IndiePie. Um, so those are also actually part of this raffle uh, this evening. Um, but joint meetups like this are worthy of a change of pace. So all of those who enter will also have a chance to win a Nintendo Switch. So we're gonna select a total of three winners. Um, you can enter with the QR code or the bit.ly link that you see, and Joe is gonna drop that in the uh, YouTube chat as well. And that's gonna be open um, throughout the entire time the meetup is um, on for those who are watching tonight. Now, because of compliance and because I actually have to have acceptance of a prize because we're a public company, I, I can't do a live drawing, but what will happen is within two business days, all the winners will be selected, will, will be contacted. And once those prizes are claimed, I'm gonna share those with the uh, meetup communities so everyone knows who won and uh, we can all celebrate uh, with you. And hopefully it will be you. I don't know who I just pointed to, but it's gonna be somebody hopefully I pointed to tonight. But anyway, just uh, guys, really, really pleasure to uh, be part of your communities. Thanks again for everything that you do. And uh, I'm gonna, looking forward to listening to the talks tonight. So thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna post the, post the links right now here. Yeah, two, those two, two links here. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it, we really appreciate sponsorship from uh, from our sponsors because um, we're able to put on especially when the all, all sorts of activities and especially when we meet in person again um, you know there's a lot of resources we we need to to have in order for that to happen well we're looking forward to hopefully getting out to both meetups in person very very soon so thanks guys thank you bye-bye bye let's see Hang on one second There we go. Um, so let me go back to my slideshow here. And here we go. So I just wanted to mention some initiatives that Chippy has. Um, we have uh, a few events that happen besides our, our main, main meetings. We have the project night, which is a space for uh, people to get together and work on projects as a group. And, and sometimes we have other activities. There's the buddy mentorship program at chippymentor.org for um, uh, if you're looking for a mentor or looking to mentor someone, uh, this is an app that lets you um, connects you with those people. And the the, the Python lunch break is an event where um, it's basically chippy during lunch. So it's um, uh, we have a few upcoming events. Um, the Python Project Night and Web Guild is on June seventeenth, uh, July July first. Oh, I think these are. <laughs> July, I think I think these are outdated. Uh, so apologies for that. Um, but uh, check out our, check out our meetup.com for um, the latest and greatest um, upcoming events. We'll uh, we'll keep you posted. And that brings us to tonight's schedule. Uh, we have two amazing uh, talks: one by Andrew Knight, and one by um, 
our very own here, uh, Kelvin Hendricks Parker. So we'll get to those in, in just a minute. Um, just some bookkeeping about the um, about the event uh, here. If you want to participate and ask questions, uh, feel, feel free to do so in the chat to uh, on the side of your screen. And um, note there's a little bit of a, a delay before uh, before the event goes or before the the text goes live. So if you have questions, start asking them kind of as the, the talker is, is wrapping up. And to get us started with that conversation, um, what what news, what's latest and greatest in the Python community? What news have you heard upcoming? I was looking for some good articles to post, but I would be curious to see what everyone is excited about in Python. Um, so after tonight's meetup, meet we have a, um, uh, a hangout in the Chippy dot town gather gather town um, group. So if you want to um, participate in that in, in our in our after hours event, um, come out and hang out. It's like a two D space where you can kind of meet up and and, and hang out. Um, live tweet using the hashtag uh, indypyxchippy. And uh, let's see. And then this I think is the. Um, uh, and another announcement about the JFrog um, raffle. So, please. Oh, no. so that that one specifically oh. is for a JetBrains ah, uh, PyCharm Jet professional. Yeah. So oh. we, we we I'll do a well. I guess I'll actually make a separate drawing, kind of like Ari's going to do for folks. If you are registered through MeetingPlace.io slash IndiePy, you'll be in the running, and we will email you a notification if you win. Great. Uh, thank you for the info on that. Um, you can reach us at our respective uh, Twitter handles. So um, feel free to subscribe. And uh, you can join us on Slack via our respective uh, Slack Slack channels. And um, if, you've, if you don't remember anything from this talk, you can <laughs> reach out to our respective websites to um, go as um, as a jumping off point for all the other resources. All right, I hope, I hope we're not hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So um, okay, here's here's where the after party is going to be. But with with that, I would like to um, get started with the talks, and um, we're going to bring on um, Andrew Knight to begin. So let me bring him onto the stream. Hey, hello, uh, Andy. So I, I I don't know if I get to do the official intro for you, but if you look on Andy's site uh, on his like about page, there's a picture of him with like a sword and a Python shield. And a little bit of trivia is I was standing right across the aisle way from him at PyCon in Cleveland when he had that picture taken. True story. <laughs> it was a good time. I miss those days of, of PyCon. Um, so, uh, yeah, Kelvin, uh, you want to do you want to do the, the the intro questions or? <laughs> oh, or, actually, you I missed where, where are those intro questions at? Oh, actually, I could. Uh, it was just yeah, like. Well, yeah, why don't you go ahead and do this one? Because I, I, I <laughs> missed that memo. Uh, oh, no worries. Um, so I guess the first question is, uh, how did you get started with uh, with Python? How did I get started with Python? Wow. I first started doing Python when I was in high school, back in 2005, six ish I was part of a, a magnet program for math, science, and computer science, and I took a programming survey course. One of the languages we did was Python. I think it was around like Python 2.3. Two, four, you know, dark old days. That was cool. Did it a little bit, had fun. Never touched it again until about 2015 when I hired on to a company here in Raleigh. And uh, the big three languages they used were Java, C Sharp, and Python. I was like, okay, well, let me let me pick this up. And I just I fell in love with it. I thought it was great. It's simple, it's complex, it's con or simple, concise, um, very easy to use. You can import everything, it's magic. Uh, I, as a software engineer in test, I do a lot of test automation. So um, using PyTest was just like, wow, this is an amazing framework. And then uh, starting around 2018, I actually got involved in the Python community. Like I met Calvin at my first PyCon in 2018 in Cleveland. I met a whole bunch of people. I've I've talked way too much about Py Python now. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that's how I got into Python. Well, uh, it was great, great having you. Thanks for speaking about it again. Um, Besides um, Python, what other languages are you um, interested in learning about? And or sure, sure. Wait, so, Joe, are, are there other languages we should be concerned with? Here? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, fun fact: I'm actually not a a Python developer at my nine to five. I'm actually a, a C# .NET 
kind of person. And when I tell people that, they're like, what? No, you're you're like the Python testing guy. How? True story, nine to five, I'm in C Sharp with SpecFlow. So it's, I'm, I do a lot of C Sharp. I mean, I, I historically I've done Java. Um, historically I've done JavaScript as well. Uh, it, you name a language, I'll pick it up, man. I taught myself how to program on a TI-83+. So, <laughs> yeah. TI supports Python now. Yeah, actually. it does? No way. I still have my calculator here, look at this. Oh, I missed that thing. <laughs> oh man, that's great. Um, uh, well, great, great. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, why don't you, um, you know, take it away and get us started? Sure. Let me see if I can share my screen successfully here. Okay. Uh, share screen. Hope this works. Share the whole thing. And I see uh, one showed up. Let me add you here. Cool. So um, just to confirm, can everyone see my uh, my full full screen slide? Okay. Uh, yep. Yep. Great. Awesome, cool. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you everyone for being here to, to listen. Um, my name is Andy Knight. You may also know me as the Automation Panda or as Pandy. Uh, I am a software engineer in test at Precision Lender. I've been there for about three years. I love it there. Uh, what, what is a software engineer in test? I build solutions to testing problems. That could be automation, that could be process, that could be whatever that entails. So if you'd like to keep in touch, please uh, check out my blog, automationpanda.com, and hit me up on Twitter, at automationpanda. So my talk tonight won't necessarily be about Python, per se. Uh, my talk is going to be about test data, hence the title, Managing the Test Data Nightmare. <coughs> Handling test data is one of the toughest challenges in testing. When I say test data, I'm referring to multiple things. Test data includes both the actual data inside the product under test, as well as the data values used by test cases. As testers, we shouldn't underestimate the work to handle test data properly. Good data is just as important as good tests and good automation. So in this talk, we'll dive deep into the connection between product data and test case data. We'll learn how to pick the right test strategies for handling both, including how to avoid data collisions when testing. And by the end of our talk, you'll know how to manage the test data nightmare for your own test projects. So if this sounds exciting, let's learn. Let's say that we have an application for a bank to provide loans. The bank could, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. The bank could configure this application for many different types of loans, such as a home loan, a car purchase, or even student loans. All of the information the bank needs to provide the loans must be stored as data in the system. Each loan product is different. It comes with its own rate, maturity, and payment schedule. The bank must also store information about borrowers, funding curves, and profitability targets for loan opportunities. It's fairly complicated. Testing requires that all of that data to be already be in the system as a prerequisite. We could write a simple test case to exercise the basic application behavior that we've just described. Our scenario could be to create a new loan application. Given the Chrome browser is open and the page for myloanapp.com is loaded, when the user creates a new loan application for a home mortgage and the user enters all their personal information, and the user submits the application, then the page displays the success message with a reference number and the loan application is sent to the bank. Now, bear in mind, a real loan application probably needs several pages of information, but let's keep our example simple for now. This test creates and submits a new home mortgage loan application for the user. There are many test data points in this short scenario. Most apparently, all the user's personal information. There's also the type of the loan, the record of the loan being sent to the bank, and the reference number shown to the user. Furthermore, the URL itself is configuration info, and the browser is a test input. Test data is everywhere in this short, simple scenario. Moreover, the data is inextricable from the test. Without specific data, 
this test would be meaningless. Unfortunately, the term test data can be ambiguous. We've applied it to both the product data and the loan web app, as well as to the various pieces of test case data that make up even the most basic test case. Product data refers to real data living in the software system. For our loan app, product data includes all the bank products configuration and lending information. Test case data, on the other hand, refers to data used to define test cases. It may include values to enter into the product under test, inputs to control how testing is performed, or records to retrieve from the product. In the latter case, test case data is a reflection of product data. Its values refer to entities existing in the product data. The two types of test data are separate but connected. Distinguishing these two types of test data is important to avoid confusion. The dependency of test case data on product data can be brittle. For example, consider a test case step to create a new loan application for a home mortgage. The step works as long as the bank's web app is configured for home mortgages. However, the product data could be changed at any time, just like product code. What if the specifics of a home mortgage application change? What if the loan is no longer called a home mortgage, but a personal residential loan? That could make the test case break. Compounding breakages cause nightmares for test management. Ugh, don't I know it. So how should we manage test data? For feature testing, test data is just as important as test cases and test code. How do we handle both product data and test case data? Are there strategies we can use to avoid brittle dependencies? In this talk, we'll explore multiple ways to handle both product data and test case data. Unfortunately, there are no universal or perfect solutions to the test data problem, but you can avoid nightmares by picking strategies that work well for your needs. Let's start with product data. As stated previously, product data is any live data in the product or system under test. In the simplest terms, it is everything in the database. Examples of product data include, pardon me, user accounts, administration settings, product customizations, records created by users, and files uploaded by users. For our example loan app, product data would include the user accounts, loan products, settings, loan applications, and behind the scenes bank data. Data must be present in the product as a prerequisite for most testing. There are two primary ways to get that data in the system. On one hand, you can set up the data before running tests. This would be a static data creation. For example, the loan web app could be set up with a set of pre-registered users and a collection of loan types. Test cases, whether they are manual or automated, can presume that this static data is already in the system and simply reference it. Static data preparation is a good strategy for complicated data or data that's slow to create dynamically. For example, user accounts may need email verification so it might be easier for automated tests to simply use a set of pre-registered users. Tests will run faster. They can simply reference existing data instead of creating new data each time. However, static data must be maintained. Any changes to static data could impact tests too. Static data may also become stale over time as data formats are updated or if the data is time sensitive. On the other hand, you can set up data during test execution. This would be dynamic data creation. In the simple loan test case, the loan application document is dynamically created. The test does not reference an existing loan application. It creates a new one. Dynamically created records avoid the brittleness of hard references to static data. They can also be used exclusively by the current test case protecting them from interruptions by other test cases. The main downside of dynamic data prep is the execution time. 
it slows down your tests. Dynamically created data is essentially disposable too. So it should be cleaned up eventually. Which strategy is best? Typically, testing requires both strategies together. Data that is slow to set up or considered immutable should use static preparation, while data that is quick and easy to set up should use dynamic preparation. When I develop test solutions, I prefer to create as much data as possible dynamically per test to preserve test case independence. When a test creates the data it needs dynamically, it will be the only test using that data, and there's a much lower risk of test collisions. These two data prep strategies are a bit complicated when implementing them. Dynamic prep de depends directly upon the test case using it. However, static prep has a few general strategies that are independent of the test cases. The simplest data prep strategy is manual configuration. <laughs> That's exactly what it sounds like. Testers log into the system and manually create whatever records need to be in the system. That could include creating users, configuration settings, and saving records. The nice thing about manual configuration is that it's a low tech. Anyone can do it. It doesn't need fancy or complicated tools. However, manual configuration is slow. It does not scale well for large systems or large test environments. And furthermore, Manually configured systems can easily fall into disrepair without any automated mechanisms for maintenance. A better strategy might be automated configuration. Rather than manually setting everything up, automated tools can create the desired data. This could be accomplished in many ways. You could reuse UI interactions from tests, you could call REST APIs, or you could possibly use tools like Puppet or Chef. Automation could generate data deterministically or randomly. The main benefit of automation is the ability to create fresh data at any time. Automation can also clean data, like scrubbing private fields or updating time-sensitive fields. Unfortunately, automated configuration is not a free lunch. It requires extra skills, and the code must be maintained. If you want a shortcut, <laughs> you can try to clone databases. Cloning databases is easier than ever with cloud management tools. You could maintain one database in a quote unquote golden state and then create a copy of it before running tests. Once testing is complete, the copy could be deleted. Granular cleanup would not be necessary. Database clones make it easy to copy all data at once without worrying about any damage that rogue testing could cause. And believe me, automation can lead to rogue testing. However, databases can have a lot of data. So cloning large ones may not be practical. Clones also may need extra refinement to scrub special fields and hook them up properly. Finally, if managing real data is too much of a hassle, then you could just mock your endpoints. Woohoo! This would completely remove dependencies on databases and even on services. All the data returned by the mocks could be deterministic too, yielding consistent results. But mm -mm -mm, mocks are not always the best solution. They often require a lot of effort to set up and mock data can make tests overlook unpredicted real world variations. Mocks also mean the tests will not truly be end to end in their coverage. These strategies can also work together. They don't need to be exclusive. For example, you could use automated scripts to configure product data in a golden database, and then you could make clones of that database. In another example, in a large test environment, you could choose to mock some endpoints while using real data for others. There are multiple factors that should be considered when deciding the best strategy for static data prep. First, how big is the data? If it's small, the manual configuration may be sufficient. If it's large, then automation may be required. How fresh does the data need to be? If data is time sensitive, then automation will be needed to keep it up to date. How frequently will the data need to be updated? Again, automation can help for frequent updates. 
how difficult will it be to try advanced tricks like mocking or cloning databases? This may be especially difficult for old legacy systems. Is there a bureaucracy in the way of automated solutions? <laughs> hey, it happens. Not every organization has an efficient or even a healthy culture. Bureaucracy can stonewall advanced solutions that need extra support. Real talk, I don't hold back. And also, do folks have the skills required for automation, database administration, or mocks? Skill level may be a barrier at first, but training and learning can help the team overcome any limitations here. And finally, cost. What about the cost? Each data, each data prep strategy has a cost. Teams should do a cost benefit analysis when making their decision. So, whew, deep breath, we've made it this far. That's product data. What about that other kind of data I mentioned before? What about test case data, the flip side of the coin? Let's look at that next. Test case data is inherently part of test cases. Let's revisit our example test case from earlier. As we saw before, there are multiple bits of test data throughout the steps of the short scenario. They all represent different types of test case data. First, let's look at that first step, given the Chrome browser is open. The Chrome browser is test data because it specifies the type of browser in which to load the web app. This is what we call a test control input. It directs how tests will be run rather than specifying feature behavior. Theoretically, the test should run the same on any browser type, but the steps dictate that the test should run on Chrome. As a best practice, test control inputs should not be hard-coded into test automation code. Instead, they should be passed into automation as inputs. That way, tests can easily be retargeted. There are a few ways to do this. The simplest way would be to create a flat file with input values. I recommend using formats like JSON or YAML because they are easy to write, easy to read, and easy for programming languages to parse. For example, Python has a JSON module in the standard library. It is beautiful. They can also have line-by-line -line diffs if you're using a tool like Git. Test automation code can read the file before any test starts, and it can inject input values as appropriate. For example, using this JSON file, automation could read the browser type and construct Selenium WebDriver objects for Chrome for each test. The path for the input file would need to be hard-coded in the automation, but it could be as basic as a standard file name in the current directory. Another way to handle inputs is using environment variables. Testers could set variables from a system shell or profile, and automation could read those variables by name. This can be useful for integrations with continuous integration servers or Docker containers. However, it can be a little more dangerous because anyone could change the variable values. But again, automation can read these variables before a test run and handle them appropriately. So let's remove that hard-coded step for browser type from this test scenario. That can be handled as an automation level concern. Next, let's look at a second type of test case data. Notice how the URL for our app is hard-coded here. This is also not a good practice. Typically, development teams host multiple instances of products under development, like a quote-unquote developer environment and a quote-unquote staging environment. Hard-coding configuration information like this limits where tests can run. Any information about a product's configuration is called configuration metadata. This can include things like URLs, usernames, passwords, and possibly other descriptors. There are a few ways to handle configuration metadata. You can use flat files or environment variables like the ones we use for test control inputs. However, I recommend using flat files. <coughs> Whoa. What was that? 
Sorry about that. Whoa, not good. So <laughs> I recommend using flat files. And I also recommend separating test control inputs from configuration metadata. Create an input to refer to the target configuration and store multiple configurations in the config metadata files. That way, testers can change just a few simple inputs to target any configuration, and they won't need to change multiple configuration fields regularly. If you want to be fancy, you could create a web service to provide configuration metadata too. This would be especially helpful for keeping secrets like passwords safe. However, creating such an endpoint may be overkill for your needs. Either way, test step can be rewritten to refer to more generic. Bleh, the test step can be rewritten more generically to refer to the web app. Automation can select the target environment using the inputs and config metadata. The remaining pieces of test case data are all in the category called test case values. These values pertain directly to behavior exercised by the test, not to any configuration factor. Even within this classification of test case values, there are subtypes. The first kind of test case value is a literal value. These are values that are hard coded in the test. In this example test, the table of personal information contains literal values. Literals are simple to use, and they provide specification by example. Literals should also be independent of any statically created product data. They should be values that can be safely originated by the test cases. The literals in this info table will be entered as input values into the web application. Theoretically, they could be any value. The second kind of test case value is an output reference. These are values that are retrieved from the product under test. Typically, they are the outputs generated by exercising a behavior. In this example test, the reference number can be scraped from the success page and verified for correct format. The loan application can be retrieved from the web apps, web apps backend to verify that it was correctly submitted. These values cannot be literals because they originate from the product. Note that difference. Test case literals can will originate from the test case, whereas output references originate from the product under test. Tests must refer to them by reference and retrieve their values from the product. As a side note, this test dynamically creates the loan application. This is an example of that dynamic product data preparation that we covered earlier. The third and final kind of test case value is the trickiest. It is an input reference. At first, these may look like literals. However, input references are values that directly refer to product data. While personal info like name and address are created dynamically by the test case and originate from the test case, the name of the loan type refers to the loan configuration in the web app. Thus, this test has an input dependency. It must specify the type of loan and the loan type must already exist in the product data. The simplest way to write this test is to simply hard code the reference. That's what's done here. The name home mortgage refers to the name of the loan type in the web app. Automation can use that name when selecting the loan type from a button or a dropdown. Hard coded references make it easy to write tests, but they require statically prepped data to exist in the system. References also become hard to maintain when the product data changes or when the same test must run against different configurations with different names. One way to avoid the pain of static data is to dynamically create these records or configurations. If the test calls the backend to create a new loan product named home mortgage for each test run, then static pre-prep isn't needed. However, we already know the pain points of dynamic prep. In this case, let's say dynamically creating a new loan type is too slow. 
A more robust solution could be data discovery. Let's say the target web app is already configured with multiple acceptable loan types. Instead of hard coding the name of the desired loan type, the test could describe the loan type and then use automation to search the web app's config to find a loan type matching the desired criteria. For example, if different regions of a bank have different names for this type of loan, the discovery mechanism could look into the config for a satisfactory home mortgage and then return the specific name for the current bank's region. Discovery enables tests to search existing product data for required records instead of hard coding references. <coughs> Discovery makes tests more resilient to changes in product data too. It's great when testing multiple environments with ever so slightly different configurations. However, Discovery requires extra coding and it may be overkill for small projects. Whew. That's a lot of information about test case data. In summary, test control inputs direct how tests will run, not what behavior is covered. They should be supplied via flat files or environment variables. Configuration data, or configuration metadata, excuse me, describe product configuration for the target environment. They should be supplied via config files or service API calls. Test case values direct the behavior covered by the tests. They may be literals, output references, or input references. Input references may be hard-coded or discovered. <gasps> Whew. Test case data. Woo, fun stuff. So at this point, you're probably thinking, wow, that's a ton of information. That's it, right? We're done? It's time for Q&A? Well, frightfully, the nightmare isn't quite over. Boom, boom, boom. There's one more problem to address. Collisions. Oh, collisions. Collisions can happen wherever multiple actors operate on shared resources. For example, they could happen whenever multiple testers simultaneously access the system or when automated tests run in parallel. Additional considerations must be taken to avoid collisions. First and foremost, you wanna isolate the test environments. Prevent external actors from interrupting tests. If you have a shared test environment, block other folks from accessing the system where tests are running. You may need to schedule test runs during off hours to guarantee this. You might also wanna set up multiple test environments. If the product under test is containerized or if databases are clonable, then you could easily dynamically create fresh environments for each test, each test launch. That would guarantee perfect isolation. Secondly, treat any shared data as immutable, meaning it doesn't change. Sometimes shared product data is unavoidable. For example, if, a test, if tests run in parallel against one test environment, then they may use the same product data. Or if an application has multiple components, certain components may be difficult to isolate for testing. Whenever data must be shared, treat that data as constant. Any changes to shared data could break other tests. For example, one test might require a car loan, but another test might delete the car loan type from the bank's configuration. Any test that must alter shared data should be run serially instead of in parallel, and they should always undo any changes that they make. Third, and finally, one thing I like to do, use dynamic data preparation as much as possible. Tests cannot collide on data they don't share. Keep statically prepared product data to a minimum. Statically created data is more likely to become shared data and shared data is more likely to cause collisions. <coughs> Boom, there it is. We've covered a lot of material in this past half an hour. So let's quickly recap what we learned. There are two types of test data, product data and test case data. 
product data can be prepared statically or dynamically. Test case data either control how tests run or reflect product data. Handle references and shared data carefully. And overall, choose the best strategies to defeat your nightmares. Every product is different and every team is different. Take the strategies I shared in this talk as suggestions. So there you have it. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. Thank you to Chippy and IndiePie for welcoming to speak. Again, my name is The Automation Panda. Um, be sure to check out my blog, follow me on Twitter, and enjoy the rest of this evening. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. Um, I certainly know the <clears throat> experience of trying to isolate test cases um, because uh, running them in parallel um, can lead to bad things if you're if you're not uh, careful. <laughs> yes. Yep. Actually, let me bring in Calvin onto the, the, the stream here. So um, if anyone wants has any questions, if you could start asking them in the chat right now. Um, and, and also, if everyone can give um, uh, give Andrew a, a round of applause in the, in the chat. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, to get us started, I have a few questions. Um, sure. And let's see. I think you're, uh, is, your, is your microphone working, Calvin? <laughs> well, we'll. We'll get the question started. Well, uh, just letting you know, or we'll get the question started uh, in the meantime. Uh, so I, I had a quick question about like um, you mentioned storing like test data in the database. What when do you usually choose to maybe use a like assume a database or a service of some sort to be present for your tests versus mock them out um, completely? Like when do you find it there to be a good when you start like mm. uh, moving towards one strategy versus the other? Sure, that is a, a great question. So really that depends on the intention you bring to your testing effort. Um, the division there I would say would be, are you looking to do some sort of white box unit testing to test the, the code itself that it meets expectation as far as the implementation is concerned? Or are you looking to, to verify at a, in a black box sense that the, the features under test, the behaviors present are meeting the intention according to the, how the end user or end consumer expects to receive it. Um, in the former case, you're looking at white box testing, unit tests, directly calling code, that's where you wanna put in your mocks. If you're looking in the latter case of, does this behavior function like an end user or an end caller would be calling it in a black box sense, meaning they don't have access to the code, that's when you want end to end, you don't wanna stub anything out. Um, typically, like I don't like to use any sort of mocks in in a in an end to end sense because mocks tend to be more trouble than they're worth. It's usually easier just to spin up a new instance of whatever entity or service that you're trying to test. And you know, part of the end to end test is making sure they all connect in harmony. And that if you do a mock, it kind of defeats that purpose. So that's where I boom boom. It's a question of intention. Cool. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Josh Martin. Uh, how do you guarantee that your tests do not have bugs themselves? Uh, seems like you have a lot of tests, a lot of code in them. <laughs> wow, the inception moment. This is a beautiful question. I love it. My how, do you know your, bugs? how do you know <laughs> your test automation doesn't have bugs? You, well, it, the thing that you have to realize is if I, we're talking about test automation here, meaning you're developing software to run testing. Test automation is software development. You can't shortchange your test automation effort, right? If you're going to be developing test automation on your own using, let's say, a, a framework like PyTest or a tool like Selenium WebDriver, you really need to treat it like a full-on software development effort. You need to have code reviews. You need to have um, version control. You need to use good tools like IDEs and stuff. You need to, um, you know, re recognize that yeah, your your code may have bugs. If you're developing any sort of support libraries or packages. Yeah, probably should be writing unit tests for those. I mean, I know this personally. I um, I am the lead developer for an open source project called Boa Constrictor, which is a .NET implementation of the screenplay pattern. And so we use that heavily at, at Precision Lender for our, our test automation solution. It's I call it the cornerstone. And if you look in the Boa Constrictor repository, go to GitHub. Um, you probably Google Boa Constrictor .NET screenplay, and you'll either hit the doc site or the Git 
GitHub repository, and you'll look inside and you'll find unit tests for a test automation library. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Swiss cheese model, right? You, you got to have multiple kinds of checks in place to make sure that your test code is good, just like your product code is good. And I'd even say those additional checks, things like code review, things like linting, things like um, running your tests locally before you commit them to the repo, things like version. Those are even more important because you don't always have that layer of testing of your tests as you would your product code. Getting it. That was, yeah, the great question. Uh, the, yeah, writing good tests takes a long time, I found. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's it's... It's my job. I mean, <laughs> yes, I know. Yes, I agree. Uh, uh, I have another question here. Um, so you have a balance between using you know, real data and, uh, and and creating test data. Like where do you, so real data, on one hand, real data is more reflective of what your actual app is going to be like producing and generating on a regular basis, but the test data, but the real data might expose, you know, user information or sensitive information to your tests? Like, where do you where do you draw the balance on that? Uh, it depends on need. Um, if, if you're testing, like, let me back up here. My starting point is always start simple before going complex. And so when I'm setting out for my test cases and I'm defining equivalence classes and the different ways of exercising different branches through my application, um, I try to have heavy control over the data that I use. Right. Um, so that I would prefer as an initial attempt to kind of set up test data on my own, you know, whether that means like specifying those test case literals for username and address, or if it means something like, OK, well, I'm going to configure a loan product for mortgages, home mortgages in my application and set up the way I expect it, because there's with that, there's that sense of um, of expectation, like, you, you know, exactly what the test is going to expect. Therefore, it can be reliable. Um, but if the system becomes too complex to where you can't manage that yourself and you can't always just create something on your own, that's when you have to kind of fall into the use of data that's there. Um, really, it's more of like a, a time versus effort kind of thing, like, oh, this is getting too much, or, oh, this thing is constantly refreshing on me. I can't reliably use it, or it's time sensitive, right? That's when I would flip over and be like, okay, well, I guess I got to use the thing that's like, you know, there. And when you do that, what you want to do is you're going to need some sort of tool or some sort of script that's going to fetch the data for you and put it where you need it and possibly do any transformation on it that's necessary. Like you don't want people's real social security numbers in there. You can just kind of blot that out, one, two, three, four, five. And so um, in that sense, you still need to know enough about the data to know what those sensitive parts are. Um, perhaps at your company, you even have a data engineering team that's already doing that kind of thing for other reasons. So maybe you can just kind of like pipe into that and say, hey, let me um, just kind of Grab that from you. Thank you for already doing the necessary scrubbing for me. Great teamwork, y'all. Things like that you can do. It actually relates to the question I had, which was when you get into large data sets, it's not always practical to bring those down to your own laptop. And do you have recommendations for how to generate sensible fixtures, so, you know, using like Faker or PyTest type tooling? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if I have any like exact things I can recommend offhand, but I do know PyTest has a whole bunch of cool plugins for that kind of stuff. Like Faker's a yeah. great one. You know, yeah. if, if you don't want to be specifying your own names, you just get random data. So any kinds of tools like that, you know, just to kind of plug in and go. Um, like I said, a lot of those test case literal values are going to be garbage in, garbage out, right? It really doesn't matter if, if the name on your application is Andy Knight or Calvin or Joe. Uh, you know, so rather than use your mental creativity you're there, you know, just kind of use something like Faker and dump it in. Or like um, sometimes you might need to develop or even, yeah, sometimes you might even need to develop more in-house tools for generating data in the formats that are proprietary or unique to the thing that you're working on. Which well, it sounds like it also gives you an opportunity to try out extended character sets. You know, people's got, mm -hmm. people's names have more than just, you know, 128, you know, ASCII oh, yeah. characters in them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Indeed, certainly. Or they may have a hyphen in them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see. I don't see any other questions um, in the chat. Uh, do you have any other questions, Calvin? Um, no, mine was around kind of large data sets because that, that's a big issue for us. Is you know, given the size of laptops and the size of the cloud can contain, 
Mm -hmm. There's usually a big parity mismatch between those two, and there could be a lot more data available to you. Yeah, yeah. I guess another point of advice I could give on that is use only as much data as you need. <laughs> yeah. Right. Especially for functional testing. Like if you're doing performance testing, yeah, you need to blow the system out. I get it. Right. But if it's like, you know, if you're really just trying to make sure that your loan, your loan can submit or you can upload your profile picture or stuff like that, it's like, you know, some people think that, oh my gosh, I need to get all this data in for it to be valid. It's like, maybe not. Let's take a step back and think like, what's, what's kind of like the, the bare minimum set or the minimal viable products that we need in yeah. In the thing under test to be able to exercise the things that we're trying to do. And I think it's doubly important for the developer onboarding experience. If you've got to bring on new developers, they need to have some kind of starting point for data to even use the app to try it out. And I, I run into this constantly where the app's been grown over time. And like now you're kind of like locked in with, well, we have to use the QA database because yeah. we can no one can hold the database on their local laptop and no one can produce that minimum set of data that actually makes the app work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel that definitely. We hit that problem where I work too. <laughs> yeah. So I think if you think a little bit of thinking up front on the testing framework and the testing fixtures, <clears throat> I think it goes a long way to actually helping new developers a year from now or 18 months from now when they're onboarding as you're growing. Because as you're growing is when you're going to have this problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Andy, do you have any call, call outs to the community or any any? calls to action for the community for anything um, before we end? Uh, mm, oh gosh. Doesn't, um, you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> I can, uh, I mean, just in my, my typical plug, I love the Python community. Even though I don't use Python at my nine to five, I still love um, working with Python. I still love giving talks and listening to talks and going to events. Um, for anyone who hasn't been to a Python conference or a Python meetup, um, once we get the chance post COVID to beet up in person, I highly recommend you do it. That's how I met Calvin, it's you know, the best. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's like, the best. it is amazing. I mean, like Calvin and I were together at Pi Tennessee right before everything shut down. That was my you last in-person conference was Pi Tennessee yep. where we were at. Yep. Yep. So I just, I just want to, you know, shout out the Python community is, is awesome. You know, it's, it's very welcoming, very friendly, great place to learn, great place to plug in, whether you're, you consider yourself a newbie or an expert. So that'll be my plug. Um, real quick, second plug, I'm also writing a book on software testing. So be sure to follow me for more updates. I've, I'm, I'm waiting for like um, a little bit more of the development process to come along before I like launch a site and all that. But just note that I'm working on it and it's exciting and it's gonna be in Python. <laughs> so. Awesome, I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Uh, there's one more question, but maybe you can answer that in the uh, in the YouTube chat uh, as uh, just to just like move things along. Uh, but thank you very much for um, thank you very much for your talk, and um, uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right, we'll, we'll take a few minutes break, maybe uh, give it a like a five minute break, uh, and come back with another great talk from uh, Calvin. So please stick around. Oh, no pressure. No pressure there. <laughs> It'll be great. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. <laughs> all right. Um, talk to you in a few. Or see you all in a few minutes.
my mic was my mic was muted. Uh, welcome back. We have another great talk planned um, right now. So um, thank you, uh, Calvin, for for uh, for being a part of this, or, or for co-hosting this with us, and uh, for um, and for giving this talk. Um, oh my my uh, my camera finally came in focus. I was uh, it's like I was. <laughs> you were in a haze I, earlier. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, let's, uh, so as far as um, how you got into Python, um, what, what's your story behind, behind that? And my origin story for Python. So I was working out in San Francisco. I graduated college, moved out to San Francisco and started working for a startup. And the guy next to me, we were in like this really tight quarters. He's like, check this out. There's this Python based application server called Zope. And I don't think I understood other, every third word and I, I picked it up, checked it out, and I kind of started my Python journey with the Zope community. But I went to my first PyCon in 2003, I think it was, when I was in George Washington University uh, in Washington, DC, and I got hooked. I was, <laughs> as, as they say, I, I came for the language, but I stayed for the community. Absolutely 100% true. Um, it is really a great place to be. So that, that was definitely my, my, my start into the language of Python. And then we built a whole business around coding in Python. I wanted to be able to code every day or pretty, provide a place where everyone could work every day and build things they love to in the languages that they love. So Python was mine. So I said, we're going to build a Python company. Nice. Or what area of Python do you kind of find yourself gravitating uh, around mostly not currently yeah. or or whenever? Oh my gosh, it's so diverse. Yes. I, Python does so many awesome things. It's, it's not a one trick pony. Uh, so we do a lot of, like, obviously we do a lot of web, so a lot of Django. Um, historically, we've done a lot of Plone, which is still, in my opinion, the best open source content management tool that you could use. Uh, but you know, Django, we do a lot of work in Ansible, Salt, which are also you know tools built on top of Python. A lot of AI ML now. We're doing some really cool stuff, Scikit-Learn, a lot of the you know, machine learning languages. Uh, it's, it's just kind of all. It's interesting because you know Python solves a lot of problems, and once you know Python and you've got two kinds of problems, um, usually Python's somewhere in that stack as a good tool to use. So it makes us super effective. Yeah. Um, so I know this is being a, a Python meetup. <laughs> uh, meet, um, it's blasphemous to say or to ask, but uh, what kind of other languages do you, uh, do you find yourself enjoy liking or wanting to explore or using? Uh, probably more recently been JavaScript, Node, and React, some of the more of the front end type things is, would probably be what's common for us or even for me, but it's real rare. I mean, a long time ago in, the, in a whole nother lifetime, I did some Java work, but very, very little. Uh, in the end, I found Python and loved it and I'm going to stick to it. Yeah, same same with me. It's uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's why we're all here, I guess. <laughs> right. Well, I'm looking forward to your talk. Uh, without further ado, I, I um, we can get started. Let me cool. uh, share your screen. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, here we go. All, All right, right. Cool. Um, take it away. Awesome. So again, my name is Calvin Hendricks Parker. I am CTO and co-founder of Six Feet Up. We are a Python and cloud consulting company uh, based out of Indiana, but we have people all over the globe now, which is super exciting. And I love the fact that Python kind of brings together a community, a global community of folks to do awesome work together. Uh, we have actually founded our company in 1999. It sounds weird when I say we're a 22-year-old Python consulting company. I guess that puts us up, up there in the kind of granddaddy of Python consulting companies. But one of the things that I think we take for granted as being like a long-time Python company is like how we got here and how you know we got Python even installed on our machines and the kind of like trouble that we've gone through over the years to maintain you know, our, our work environments. When you think about your laptop or your desktop that you work on every day, day in, day out, that is your workstation. That is where you get work done. That's where you want to be productive. And you don't want to be wrestling with it. You don't want to be you know, wanting to throw it out the window because something's not working as expected. So I want to talk a little bit about that today, uh, kind of reflecting on <clears throat> maybe some of the things I take for granted that a lot of people starting out with a language uh, will really hopefully um, be able to take take advantage of and not have to go through the same kind of pain and, uh, and trouble that some other folks do. I mean, we see this when we work on projects with other other clients where their their computer systems are kind of like, uh, well, I'll get into that in a second here. But let's start with setting our intention. It's not all uh, doom and gloom and, and bad stuff. I always like to, when I'm talking to a group 
who are new to Python, <clears throat> make sure that I enlighten them with the Zen of Python. Uh, if you have not seen the Zen of Python, which is possible, so that's why I still mention this in most, a lot of my talks where I'm, I'm kind of addressing either introductory topics, is if you type, this is the command line, Python minus M this, there is a Easter egg module inside of the standard library of Python called this that brings you the Zen of Python. <clears throat> and I tell folks that they should literally print this out, go find a nice frame, hang it up in the bathroom, and every day when you're brushing your teeth, you should read through it. Uh, it's not just good you know, lessons for Python. I find it to be good life lessons in general. And so we're gonna focus on a couple areas of the Zen of Python, but if you aren't familiar with it, make sure you go check it out. Uh, there's obviously some funny things in there too, but I think it really is meaningful. And if you set that intention as you go forth in your career as a developer, or even if you're not a you know, developer professionally, but you're using code to solve kinds of problems, I think you should be able to consider yourself a developer and you should you know, pay attention to these awesome you know, tenants of the Zen of Python. Now, what's, what's the bad? <clears throat> I don't know if folks have seen this cartoon, but uh, XK, there's an XKCD for probably every situation. And of course, there was an XKCD uh, made in 2018 about your Python environments on your local machine. Uh, he admitted that he did some bad things to get to this point. Uh, so the uh, author of XKCD is Randall Monroe. But the, uh, the, the usually the alt text of these cartoons is pretty funny as well, that the Python Environmental Protection Agency wants to seal it in a cement chamber with pictorial messages to future civilizations warning them about the dangers of using sudo to install random Python packages. And that's how you can end up with your laptop looking like a super fun site, uh, a mess of Pythons all over the place, because you tried one thing, tried another thing, tried this other thing, tried the third thing, and somehow you ended up with a thing that works, but you can't get there again is, is a big issue. And so I wanna make sure that folks get started on the right path in a reproducible way, so that when a senior dev comes over to help you, they know what's going on. Or when you go to help someone else, you all are kind of speaking the same language, uh, not just the Python language, but like you've got your system in a state where it's easy to use for folks to help you out. Uh, what happens is Python lives in many places. Uh, so if you, if you have a fresh out of the box, like you just pulled your laptop out and you want to start coding on a, a project, there's a lot of options for, afforded to you. Uh, I guess you know, with, with options comes kind of great responsibility that you have to make choices now. There's not like a super strong opinion. And I'm hoping to actually provide some more opinionated approaches today to help with getting started. Uh, the first thing that place you're gonna find Python is gonna be in the operating system. Uh, if you pull out a brand new Mac and you open up terminal without installing another single thing on the machine, you're gonna get a Python prompt. Uh, same thing goes for like Red Hat and Ubuntu and a lot of the uh, Linux distributions. If you installed Python from an app store, like for example, Microsoft has Python in the app store, that's another way of getting Python onto your machine. Uh, you could have just gone to python.org and downloaded an installer. So there's like MSI or EXE installers there. You could download a, the source code and you could install it directly from source. You could be installing it from package manager, um, whether you're using Linux and using apt, uh, using homebrew or chocolatey on various platforms like Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, those are ways of getting a, a, a pretty source safe looking Python onto your machine. But they're, those are distribution managers where you are like package managers for third party applications on your, on your own computer. And so they, they, they move like your, if you install Python 3.9, uh, it's going to move as you update and update and update from 3.91, 3.92, 9.3.9.3. And maybe you don't want to do that just yet. You want to have a little more control over your destiny as a Python developer. And there's also Python distributions. Uh, Active State and Anaconda are both makers of commercial but free for individual use uh, Python distributions that may look very attractive as an easy route to get started. But I will show you maybe where the real path may lie. <clears throat> so why should you care about all this? I know I'm going on and on about like Python and all these various ways you can install it. I think the the real like kind of key is that you, sh you, again, your laptop, your workstation, that is how you are productive and make money as a Python developer. And you need to make sure that you keep your tools sharp and in good condition. And part of keeping your tools in good condition is keeping them clean. Uh, if you have to spend a whole you know day or a half a day 
recovering your laptop because you installed five things and all of a sudden they're conflicting and now you've got to basically go through kind of an uninstall or some kind of dependency problem for one thing or another. You don't want to spend that extra time not being productive and actually coding on Python. One of the best parts about Python is that it stays out of your way. It's like a super productive language. It's really easy to get started. And it's really easy to be productive at a production scale. And so you want to make sure you treat that workstation as like your best friend. Uh, you wouldn't throw mud all over your best friend. You wouldn't get them all dirty and drag them, you know, all kinds of crazy places. You would want to like keep your best friend like nice and clean, like you know your best friend, your your dog here, and make sure that they're well fed and that they are you know take, taken good care of, that they go to the doctor every so often and get their checkups, and that they're just in generally in good health, so that you're always productive whenever it comes down to getting started on a new project. You care more about attacking the problem than dealing with your system. Uh, I, I love kind of the direction that development and development tools have gone recently in that I only care about developing on the, the, the problem at hand. I'm trying to stay away from, you know, getting into my package manager and installing crazy dependencies and dealing with, you know, different versions of this or that and incompatible versions. So this is why I really want everyone to care about this is so that you spend less time toiling in the system and more time having fun developing on the Python code. So I want you all to stay Zen. Uh, we're gonna focus on kind of these three specific tenets of the Zen of Python, which is beautiful is better than ugly, explicit is better than implicit, and simple is better than complex. Actually in um, Andy's talk prior, he, he really mentioned kind of an emphasis on staying simple until you, it can't be uh, simple any further. So I think those are all great words to live by. And I'm gonna show you some examples of how we can do that as Python developers and keep your laptop like a, a temple or a, a Zen meditation space where it's a pleasure to go to and not uh, troublesome or getting in your way. So first, we're gonna to have to talk about some rules. Uh, kind of like Fight Club, <clears throat> there are certain rules you're gonna to to abide by. Uh, number one rule, which is no pseudo. Uh, if you are reaching for sudo, uh, it feels wrong. It's kind of like a smell test in coding. If it feels wrong, it probably isn't right, and maybe there's a better way of doing it. If you're reaching for sudo as a developer on your own laptop, and even if you're reaching for sudo on a staging or a dev machine or some, some other you know, environment, there's probably something wrong. There's probably not a good reason to be using sudo for installing anything on your machine uh, even when it comes to development tools. Uh, there are great packages or utilities out there like Homebrew and Chocolatey for Linux, Mac, and OS, uh, Mac OS and Linux and Windows that will allow you to install most of the dependencies, most of the libraries, anything you would need without ever having to touch sudo. Uh, what's nice with, I, I use Homebrew, uh, I'm on Ubuntu, but I made the transition from Mac OS to Ubuntu a couple of years ago and I just kept using Homebrew uh, because it was super easy to get started with. It allowed me to install nice tools, you know, wgits and curls and like all the kind of auxiliary things that are not Python very, very easily without ever having to use sudo. There'll be some exceptions for system tools and things you want to install on your laptop. But generally, if you can get away without ever running sudo, especially when it comes to running Python or installing a Python package, you don't want to do it. I don't care, no whining, we're not going to use sudo to install stuff onto our laptop when we're doing our for our development environment. The second rule, uh, we're not going to use the system Python. I don't care what it is, where it is, where it came from. It's not yours. You can't touch it. Uh, the system Python is there for the system to use. <clears throat> if it's installed into user bin or user or our bin and it's part of the system that came with like Ubuntu or Red Hat or Mac OS, those are the systems Python and not for you to install things into and absolutely not for you to use even when you're installing uh, virtual environments, which I'll talk about later. That system Python, it could actually trip you up. Uh, for example, if you're on Ubuntu, the system Python Ubuntu out of the box doesn't include pip. Uh, it doesn't include uh, others, you know, kind of core parts that you would think of when the batteries included version of Python. It is a stripped down purpose built version of Python just for that specific system. If you're on FreeBSD, the system, the Python you would install from the package manager, even inside of, Python, of FreeBSD, won't include TK Enter or SQLite. 
So you're going to be stuck with a kind of crippled or I don't know. It's, it's just that Python is there for the system. Same thing for Mac OS. Uh, you're at the whim of the updates from the OS as to when it gets updated. It's typically lagging behind. It's not a place you want to be. Don't use it for anything. I know what you're saying. Okay, smart guy. How do I get Python onto my computer and be productive? How can I actually be a great developer and solve awesome problems uh, using Python? Well, I think the, the best way we've found so far <clears throat> is to use PyEnv. Uh, PyEnv is a great tool for allowing you to install arbitrary versions of Python that you control onto your system. So you actually can change the global Python version that you would use. So if you're at a terminal anywhere you're at and you type Python, you get that global version of Python that you set from PyEnv. Or if you've got a specific directory, like per project Python versions, you can set a local version of Python. So whenever you're in a specific directory or below, PyEnv is going to automatically figure out like, well, this project's using Python 3.5. And so whenever he's in this directory or below, you'll use Python 3.5 as the default interpreter. Uh, you can also override Python versions with environment variables and then search commands for multiple versions of Python at, at a single time. This is really helpful when it comes to uh, testing multiple versions of Python against your library. Uh, for example, if you're using Tox, uh, it's really easy to install. So if you go to the PyM installation instructions, uh, for Mac and Win and for Linux, I highly recommend using Homebrew again. Uh, just brew install uh, PyEnv and you're on your way. For Windows, there is a PyEnv Windows installer. But right now, so PyEnv, the standard PyEnv doesn't work out of the box on Windows unless you're using the Windows subsystem for Linux, which I highly recommend as a, as a Python developer. You get all the niceties of uh, kind of the Linux environment with all the creature comforts of using your standard Windows GUI with all your Windows tools. So if you want to use Windows, there's definitely a PyM for the native Windows, or there's a PyM just works out of the box, just like it was Ubuntu for the Windows subsystem for Linux. So let's see PyM in action. And this is where we're exercising the explicit is better than implicit uh, rule of the uh, Zen and Python. So we're going to um, actually start over here. I'll do just the pyenv command. I've already you know, installed pyenv, brew installed pyenv onto my machine. It's good to go. If I look at what versions I have installed, I can just do pyenv versions. You'll see I've got the system Python, which I don't ever want to use. I've got Python 2.7 for legacy projects that are still on Python 2. I have a system, like my default global Python interpreter right now, you can see the little asterisk by it. I'm using 3.8.6, but I can install any version of the Python I want in here. And if I want to actually get another version of Python for a specific project where I'm explicitly controlling what version of Python I want to use, I can do Python uh, install. And if we want to see specifically uh, versions of Python that are C Python with um, like for version three, we'll just do this. We'll do three dot, like I want to see what versions of 3.9 are available. So this actually goes and grabs a list of all the Pythons that are available for PyEnv right now. And so you can see, oh, look, there's I'm on Python 3.9.4 is one of the last ones I have installed, but 3.9.6 is available. So let's just do PyEnv install 3.9.6. And that will go grab the source code. It will compile it. It will use the homebrew readline libraries. It will give you all the niceties and comfort, creature comforts at home that you expect. And it gives you everything that's supposed to come with Python, uh, including like you know pip being available as part of like Python three and above, uh, being able to do virtual ims, the VM module, all those things are going to be there and not missing from your installation. Uh, we will come back to that. So if I'm going to work on a specific project, I'm going to make a directory for our meetup. We'll see. So if I look at pyenv global, you'll see I'm using three eight six. That was what we saw when I typed in versions. If I go into Meetup and say I want to actually develop using 394, since I know I had that installed, I can type pyenv local and just specify 3.9.4. And now when I'm using Python, the Python command right here, I will actually get a 394 Python instead of a 386 Python. If I control D and go up a directory and type Python, like just same I just did, I get 386. Also installed from PyEnv, but not the one for that specific directory. So I go back into Meetup 
And you'll see what pyenv did was created a .python version file right at my root of my home directory, or not of this home directory, but of the directory of the project I'm in, saying, if we look at the, what's the contents of that file, it'll have the environment I'm using. Uh, and they say environment. It's more than just a version. pyenv has some plugins we'll talk about in a minute. And that can actually specify a specific virtual environment to make your development life even easier by giving you a sandbox for uh, working with a specific version of Python. Now, if I'm in uh, 394, uh, we shall, so I kind of showed the, all the, the pyenv uh, commands here. You can actually see there's you know a lot of things you can do with pyenv, but we can actually install specific versions. We can see what versions are, are in play. You can actually see, so the which command, if I do which Python, it's going to show me that it's pointing at a directory in my home directory called pyenv.pyenv slash shims slash Python, which isn't very helpful because if I go up a directory where I'm using 3.8 and I type the same command, I'm going to get the same result. Now, that's pyenv wrapping around the Python interpreter and saying and figuring out what version should be called based on that pyenv version. So if I do pyenv, uh, which, and then specifically the command Python, I can see that that Python is coming from uh, versions stored in my versions installed from PyM um, for 3.8.6. And if I go back into Meetup and do the same command, you'll see that's a 3.9.4. So the PyM which command kind of overrides and actually gives you more explicitly what Python you're specifically using. Now, again, you don't want to install uh, your packages into this. So I'm, I'm in 3.9.4. If I do a pip freeze, this is basically the equivalent of still your global Python. You'll see the pip freeze here shows there's no packages installed into this 3.9.4 other than just the stuff that comes with the standard library. <clears throat> and I don't want to muddy up that specific Python because I want to treat these PyM versions just like they're still um, the global Python interpreters that I would use from the system, except this time I compiled them. I'm controlling what versions they are. And I know where they came from, and I know all the things are compiled, all the options are compiled with. So that gives me that explicit is better than implicit um, rule of PyEnv in action. Now the next bit here is PyEnv has some awesome plugins. So PyEnv has plugins for virtualenv and virtualenv wrapper, and I'll show you those right now. So if we actually wanted to create a virtual environment, so the virtual environments are just sandboxes where you can now muddy it up all you want throw it away, it can be recreated as long as you've got a good requirements file. <clears throat> so let's look at that right now. Let's, let's from this like meetup directory, we're going to make a virtual environment using the pyenv virtual environments. So if I do pyenv virtual env, and we'll make a, uh, you know, just one called demo chippy indie pie. I think that's the right command. So this, this is actually behind the scenes, creating a virtual environment and, and basically getting it ready for me to go. Now, oops, Siri wanted to like talk to me. I already have the PyM um, plugins installed. You'll see that there's the uh, PyM command, delete, init, and prefix. And so list off actual other PyMs as well. Uh, we need to get our virtual environment ready to use here. And the way you do that is just like you do for specifying the local environment. So if I'm gonna do pyenv, and for this specific project, I wanna use that um, directory I just set up. I'm gonna say the local is gonna be demo.chippy.indypy. So instead of specifying the version, I'm specifying a virtual environment I just created. And so now um, my, my shell is actually set up to show me what virtual environment is active. And anytime I'm in this directory, the demo chippy indie pie is gonna be active. And if I look at that Python version file, it shows that virtual environment instead of the version number uh, in that Python version. So now, anytime I go into this directory, it automatically will activate that virtual environment. So I go out of the directory, hit return, it deactivates the environment. If I type Python, I'm in 3.8.6. If I go into the meetup directory, Return again. It's, it's the my little prompt thing kind of lags behind one command, and if I now use the pip command to install requests, for example, 
it's going to install that into the virtual env and not into the 394 environment. So if I do pip freeze, we should, as expected, see you know, the request library installed there. If I go up a directory and I make a new directory called foo and cd into foo, and if I now do pyenv local 3.9.4, just as a demo here, and do pip freeze, it should be empty. So I've got a completely isolated environment, uh, but it is a little bit kind of masked by the pyenv tools. Uh, so once I'm inside here, I'm back again in that environment. I'm not deactivating, I'm not activating. If you're you know, kind of accustomed to virtual environments, you'll normally have to like activate or deactivate. And I'll show that off here in a second because some people like the PyM plugins for virtual environments and some people like, eh, it, take it or leave it. Another nice tool, for example, is if you're using, um, you got some, maybe when you use like install HTTPy and not have it in a specific project, but just have it available in a virtual environment for you to use, that's a great way for you to use a tool called virtual wrapper. So if we do PyM make virtual environment, or no, actually, it's already installed because uh, it wraps around and into my shelf right now. PyM wrapper type wrapper. That bootstraps my environment to make it so I can now use make virtual env. And I'll make one called HTTPy demo. So that creates a virtual environment called HTTP demo, and it doesn't matter where I'm at. So I'm in the desktop folder. If I go into foo, you'll see that I'm still in the HTTP demo virtual environment. It's going to persist wherever I go because I'm using that. It's basically a virtual environment that's hidden to me. I don't see it, you know, in here. And when I created it at this local at the desktop directory, there's no virtual environment living here. If I type py in, oops, uh, which Python. Then you'll see that oh, that's my 386. Uh, but I'm using the virt oh, it's using virtual ems. So if you're familiar with virtual ems, it's going to put it in your home directory in a dot virtual ems folder to kind of hide it away from you. So there is my HTTP virtual ems directory. It does not show up as another environment that I could use for local development. I would make a virtual env for that. But if I'm in here now, I can do pip install HTTP. And now that's going to be installed into that virtual environment, which also you can remove them, throw them away, bring them back. But it's it now makes the HTTP command accessible to me to use as part of HTTP, which is super nice. And if I deactivate uh, like virtual environment, it goes away. And if I do the work on command for HTTP, it allows me to reactivate it again. So it's hidden away in the vir virtual and wrappers directory. It's not specified as like an environment for PyM that I could use. Now, if you want to see other pyenv plugins, uh, you could do brew search pyenv. And you'll see there's a couple other plugins, but the main ones I use are going to be virtual and virtual and wrapper uh, for quick things like that. And again, if there's questions, feel free to drop them into um, the chat. I'll kind of be watching for it. I see Josh asked if there were brew files for Linux, and there are, and because that's what I'm using here uh, today with you all is Ubuntu for virtual and virtual wrapper. So I did show off virtual and virtual and wrapper. Now, you don't have to use the PyM to make your virtual environments. Uh, maybe you don't want them to be hidden from you. So if I deactivate that. Oh, one last thing before I kind of move on. You can see over here, Python 3.9.6 got installed. And if I type PyM versions, you'll now see 3.9.6 is available for me to use as, as a new environment. So I can actually create specific you know, virtual environments for Python 3.9.6, and you're on your way, and you've controlled it. Like You're not at the whim of the OS. You're not at the whim of like the package manager. You're not at the whim of, Py of Brew or any other thing. You are in control of what version of Python you are using, which is another thing I like. So speaking of being in control of what version of Python you're using, if I go back into that Meetup folder, you'll see I'm back in using this uh, in the pi, so if I do pyenv uh, local, I think it's unset. Maybe it's dash unset. Are you getting the uh, real time demo version of this? I think you can unset. Ah. You can also just remove. 
Python version. There it's gone. So now it deactivated the environment. It didn't detect that I'm using a, a PyEnv inversion here. If I want to actually install a local sandbox right inside this meetup directory called VMV, I would recommend to folks to use just the VM that's included with um, Python. So out of the box, Python has the ability to create these sandboxes. You don't need to use the virtual env uh, add-on or install it. You actually, it's a lot simpler just to use that uh, specifically. And if I wanted to, well, I can do like this. I can do pyenv uh, local, and we'll use 396 because we just installed it. So now if I type Python, I should get a 396. And if I type Python minus m vmv, and I want to make a virtual environment called vm right here, this is the command that will give me just a plain old virtual environment sitting right in this directory that I can see. It's not hidden away in any of those dot directories at my root of my home dir. Oops. There you go. You can see there's a VM right here. And I can activate it just like anything else. So if I do source VM, then activate, uh, I will get my VM. Now, one thing I don't like about this specific technique is that all your virtual environments, typically in this kind of pattern, end up being named VM. So if I CD out and back into another directory, I won't know if I go into like foo that I'm not using the, I don't know what VM I'm using. Uh, necessarily, it's, at least it's not obvious. I can definitely find out, uh, but it's not obvious to me which one I'm using. But if I'm back in here, if I want to now pip install requests, it's gonna put it into this virtual environment that's sitting in this physical home directory. If I just ls vm uh, lib uh, python site packages, you'll see that the, the uh, requests and all of its dependencies just got uh, installed right into there. Uh, right into the site packages for this specific Python. <clears throat> and that is kind of like the batteries included, like I've, I need to do a sandboxed vir virtual environment for my Python. I still don't recommend doing this without pyenv because you're gonna be using the OS uh, Python, which could be crippled in some way that may not be obvious to you. Uh, so that, that's one thing to keep in mind is I still recommend pyenv for getting whatever specific version of Python you wanna use. You're good to go. Now, a lot of people don't know this. You don't have to necessarily activate a Python environment to pip install into it. If I've got a VM right here and I want to install um, like a PyYAML into this, I can actually just explicitly go to that pip command inside the virtual environment. And because I'm using the pip from inside the virtual environment, it's going to install into that virtual environment and not some other random place. So I'm explicitly controlling this virtual environment, this pip, this this is where I'm going to put it. So let's do pi yaml. And there you go. If I do pip, so this is kind of the test. If I do pip freeze, there should be nothing in here. I don't have an environment activated. It's the 396 that I just installed from pyenv. But if I do env, uh, vmv, and pip freeze, that's going to act only on this virtual environment. So you don't have to activate and deactivate. You can explicitly call uh, those environments. If I go B, uh, vm bin python, and if I import uh, requests, it'll work because I'm in my virtual environment. If I just type python, maybe if I can type today, python, and type to import requests, requests, it's still not going to work because it's not in that, it's not installed into that specific global Python interpreter. And I say global, it's still in my home directory because I installed it with pyenv, but I would, I treat those as global interpreters. I don't install anything into them. It's on a per project basis that I do that. All right. Now, if I want to install like quick tools to be like ready at my fingertips to be able to use anytime without having to activate or deactivate or use virtual env wrapper to like you know turn something on, turn something off, I will use pipx, which is an awesome tool for creating little sandboxes on the fly for um, all kinds of awesome little things. So I have pipx installed, and I recommend just installing that from Brew, uh, just like I put here, Brew install pipx, and then you need to run pipx ensure path, and that will set up your dot files to recognize the pipx uh, path appropriately. 
And then from there, you can see I've got a bunch of little environments for tools I use, like for example, Black or um, iSword or HTTPy. And so if I wanted to install, let's just um, pip x remove uh, black. Let's oh, uninstall, sorry. Now my, my command for black is gone. I use red, command not found. But as a, as a Python developer, I want to have black because like, I want to have my editor like automatically checking on save and you know basically making sure that my code looks awesome and ready to go. So if I just do pip x install black, it will create a virtual environment uh, using kind of latest Python I can find in my path, which I use 396. So I did not have 396 on my system until I did that. And now it's installed a virtual environment and actually made these in my path automatically. So black and black primer and black D are all available for me to use now. If I type black, you can see I've got uh, the black command available to me. I don't have to activate or deactivate. Uh, that's great for tools, uh, things like bpy top. Uh, if you aren't familiar, I'll make my screen bigger because it's awesome. This is like a super jazzed up version of like top or glances uh, where you can see your memory and CPUs and all the core temperatures. And if you're debugging performance problems, this is awesome, an awesome tool to use. But I want to make sure it's always in my path. So that's one of the things I would install with like pipx. Uh, another one, I'll do an example of that. I'll uninstall it first. Uh, uninstall markdown, which I use a lot. But I uninstalled the Markdown library, so now I don't have the Markdown or the Py Markdown command available to me. It's not found. If I pip x install Markdown, it's going to do like we just did for Black. It's created a virtual environment. But Markdown Py has some awesome plugins for like syntax highlighting that can use pigments. But you have to make sure the pigments is installed into that virtual environment. So with pip x, you can actually inject into the environment uh, an additional dependency. So if I just put in here what the package is, so I'm going to install an additional dependency for markdown of pigments, we should install pigments into the markdown. And now if I look at pipx list, you'll see my markdown. Oops, did I go in there? Oh, so Markdown library is included in markdown.py. Now, what if I want to use the, the pigments um, command? There's a command line tool for pigments, but it didn't install it. And that's because I didn't use the, uh, where is it at? There is an option for all the scripts for all the dependencies, which is going to be, uh, I can, uh, can't find it off the top of my head. That's all right. But there's definitely an, a version or way to include the, the command line tool for pigments as you inject those into other virtual environments. So you can actually kind of mix and match. Maybe one tool requires a different version of pigments. Now you've got all these little sandboxes where you can install specific versions because you can actually specify a version number when you installed it, uh, when you did that. So pipx is awesome. Uh, basically, I showed you kind of the, the demo here. But let's get ready to go. So I've gone over different ways of like getting some nice sandbox versions of Python installed, how to get some you know, virtual environments, virtual wrappers, pipx, um, you know, virtual environments, some virtual environments, virtual ims, virtual ims using pyenv. And these are all nice, clean ways to keep you from using the system uh, interpreter, system Python. And you may be asked, well, what about the user scheme? And so for those of you who didn't know, there was a pep where you can do a pip install with a dash dash user. And this is going to install into dot local. Let's see here. Uh, I'll do it, but only to show it off because it's not something you want to do. And also, you, any module that's installed, you can run the command line version of it with just this minus m pip. And then you're explicitly using the pip that came with that version of Python. So if you want to be really, really explicit about what you're doing, that's a great way to make sure you're getting the right pip as well. So I do pip install dash dash user requests and pip. 
uh, that's a great way to install into your your pip. So if we go to my home directory in dot local, there's going to be a lib and a Python 3.9 and a site packages. And that's actually where all this got put in. One second, sorry. So inside that site, actually, I'll just ls it. And you can see there's, there's the requirements for um, the requests package that's been installed into my user uh, lib for Python. So if I do pip freeze, I won't, I'll see all this junk kind of got installed, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, but that was for the 396 version. The issue is with installing, and it's kind of just messy in general, but also pip uninstall doesn't work with this user. So if I do pip uninstall, it's gonna be like, hmm, I don't know what dash dash user is, which kind of sucks because now you can't uninstall something from this kind of global-ish place. It's like not quite the global Python. It's kind of this in-between purgatory place where stuff can get installed and uh, kind of unfortunate. So I would recommend just not using that at all. Um, I'm going to actually remove lib altogether because I don't use it. It's kind of messy. I'm not, I haven't found a good reason to use it, especially since VM is a uh, batteries included out of the box, ready to go. All right, so we may ask, okay, what about Anaconda Python and Conda? Or what about Active State Python or PipEnv or Poetry or PDM or my, I got this pyproject.toml file. <sighs> well, there's lots of other options out there, which is kind of unfortunate because everyone kind of had their own opinions. And I'm pretty sure there's an XKCD about standards. And now we've got a competing standard to go along with all these other standards. I find a lot of these a little more complicated or a little more limiting than what I just showed. Uh, I think the PyEnv route with all the virtual ems and sandboxes gives you the absolute amount of control you want without all the extra extraneous tools and tooling that's kind of around it. Uh, I used to be a fan of pipenv, but not anymore. I found it to be slow for doing dependency resolution. Uh, I took a look at poetry. Again, that's like a whole stack of kind of knowledge you need to learn for managing your project. And once you're kind of in on using poetry, like that's how your project's managed. And so onboarding new developers means they now have to learn poetry as well. Um, PDM is not the one I really checked into too much, but it's like a Python distribution manager, kind of a package manager for your projects as well. But I want simplicity and I want repeatability. So the next tenant uh, that we're talking about is simple is better than complex. So rather than kind of installing all these other frameworks for managing all the frameworks, I want to use something that gives me uh, repeatability, but in a simple way. And if you all have not checked out PIP tools, I highly recommend that project as well. And I'll show you a little bit about PIP tools. So if we are, let's go back into desktop and meetup. In this virtual environment, we've created, you know, one of the beauty of virtual environments is they are disposable. Uh, if I want to get rid of this virtual environment, I can. And now if I look, uh, the Python version should just be showing me just Python 3.9.6. So right now I'm using Python 3.9.6 for my project, but I want to be able to lock down my dependencies for this project so that every time someone checks it out, they're guaranteed to get the same versions of the, those packages. And they're even guaranteed to get the same hashes of the files they downloaded from PyPy for those packages. And that's one of the things where pip tool really excels. So let me show you doing that. So if I make a requirements file, but instead of making a requirements file, normally if I did uh, requirements T, I would normally just put requests in here and maybe I would say a specific version, but I'm not going to at this point. Um, I'm actually going to make a requirements.in file I'm going to use to generate my requirements.txt file from. So I've got two files here, requirements.in and requirements.txt. I will generate my dependencies and grab all the hashes for my requirements.in file and have it generate my requirements.txt file, which is what I will actually install. I'll do this. Oh, I don't have my virtual environment installed here. Let's do this. Python, and VM. we're making a fresh virtual environment again called VM. We're going to install our project's dependencies into it, and we're going to use hashes this time. But as a developer, I'm going to have pip tools installed into it. So VM and pip install pip tools. So pip tools is a, has no other, has a couple dependencies, 
but it makes it available for us to use now. Compile. There we go. Pip compile. Okay, I can make this a little wider so you can see it. Uh, we, well, you know what? I'm going to start off with just pip compile because I think it'll be easier to understand. And then pip compile. This will just output the standard out. And if I just pass it in my requirements.in file, it goes to PyPy. It grabs all the dependencies that are needed for requests, figures out what the latest versions of them are. It even annotates it and tells you that uh, this came from the IN file. And these other ones are basically leaf dependencies of requests itself. But this is not quite useful yet because I want to be able to have the hashes so that I get all the output. So if I actually do with no annotate, I'll include upgrade because I always want to be checking for the dependencies to upgrade. No, and I'll explain that in a minute. No header and generate hashes. This now gives me a file that's ready to be pip installed with the hashes coming from PyPy. So if I specify that as the output file, a text. There we go. Now, if I look at my requirements.txt file, I've got my hashes. If I do vm then pip install minus r, it's going to, because I've got hashes in there, it is going to double check those hashes against what it downloads from PyPy. So I don't install the in file. I install from the requirements file. Actually, another benefit here is you can say dash dash no depths, and it will install even quicker because it doesn't have to do the dependency resolving because PyPy, uh oh, lost my camera. Uh, pip tools automatically did the resolution for us. We're certain that our text file, kind of like a I know what I'm doing flag for pip, is just install all the stuff from requirements.txt. Don't worry about doing dependency resolution. And this is what we use in a lot of our projects to make sure that we get exactly what we want installed uh, every time with the right hashes. You know, so it's repeatable. So six months from now, 12 months from now, 10 months from now, whatever, I get the exact same environment uh, ready to develop on. Because uh, things will shift uh, out from underneath you, unfortunately. And it really sucks as a developer to be kind of chasing down those gremlins or ghosts in the machine. Uh, let's see here. That is pip tools, which is awesome. Let me make sure I covered everything I wanted to cover there. I did. Uh, all right, last bit. I mean, really repeatable. Um, so I, for a lot of our production projects, we're using containers and Docker. And combining that with pip tools gives us the ability to, for example, control the version of Python, but to a certain level. Oh, one more thing I, I forgot to mention. Because my requirements file is derived from the IN file, I only track in my requirements.in file specifically the, the main direct requirements for my project. I don't worry about all the sub requirements that re requests has. I trust that the developers of requests are going to specify that they need specific versions greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. I don't want to deal with that, but I want to make sure that the next person who pulls it out gets the exact same experience I had when I did it. And then I explicitly will upgrade those dependencies by doing a pip compile myself. So if I wanted to upgrade the dependencies for requests, I rerun pip compile with that dash dash upgrade. That's why I added that in there. It will upgrade those sub dependencies. If I don't do that, it's going to just give me back the requirements.txt with the current hashes. So you can see the difference here between requirements.txt and requirements.in. It's one's got just my straight up like main dependency, which is requests. My other one has the leaf dependencies with the hashes and with their specific versions pinned. Uh, some folks sometimes do brown bag releases. That would change the hashes. That would make that would at least throw an error and alert me to the fact that some something strange is going on uh, in this specific setup. So that's one of the things, another reason why I recommend pip tools with those hashes because it's going to give you an awesome experience. So last bit, uh, making this all repeatable. I think I got a couple more minutes. I want to make sure I can get through this. Uh, using Docker with pip tools, if you're familiar with Docker, and I'll go here. 
Maybe I'll make it. There we go. Hub.docker.com slash Python, for example. You'll notice, oops, I guess it must be like under Python. Yeah. There's an official distribution of Python managed by the Python Software Foundation with specific tags. If I want to make sure that I'm always getting the latest Python 3.8, for example, or 3.9, uh, if I search through here for 3.8, I can get a container as the base of my project, specifically at 3.8.11. And if 3.8.12 releases, I'm going to still be using 3.8.11. I don't have to worry about you know it moving out from underneath me. If my project wants to always be on the latest 3.8 and not worry about these sub tags, I'd recommend using something like this tag right here, 3.8. Uh, well, I'll show you Slim Buster, for example. This one's constantly upgrading to whatever the latest minor patch version is of 3.8. So if I want 3.8.11 or 3.8.12 or 3.8.13, whenever those come out, 3.8 is a great way for me to make sure that I have that as the base Python for my project, and it's always getting the patch releases. Like I, I care about security, I care about performance, and I know that the Python team shouldn't be making any backward incompatible API changes against 3.8 in these minor patch revisions that are like .11.12.13, for example. So how do I do that? I'll show you real quick. I think I've got time. Well, actually, you know, I've got I've got a pre-made. Uh, one I did earlier that I will show because it's probably easier. Here we go. I got PyCharm up here. You can now build a Python container, run locally, and actually do all the same things I just showed, but you would do it inside the container. Uh, you would just start with a base layer of the Python 3.8. In this case, I use Slim Buster because I don't need all the stuff installed. But to make this all work, uh, in my working directory for demo Docker, I've got a requirements with my requirements.in just like I had from before. And I'll compile up my hashes just like I did before. But what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to compile those hashes against the, the container or the image that I get from Docker Hub and not against my local machine. In some cases, certain packages like pandas or numpy, there may be specific libraries that have to compile against a different C compiler. And if you don't have that same compiler installed or it's not the same compiler that's in your container, things could blow up. But if you're always using the container to do all your pip compiles, which I'll show you how I do that, you should be pretty safe. So I basically run the pip install from my text file and not from the in file. And then I'm ready to go and running my main.py against that container. I typically set up a, a make file inside of every project like this so that I have basically some convenience mechanisms for installing, or not installing, but building my, my image and then compiling my dependencies. And I'll add some other you know, convenience mechanisms in here, something like, for example, seeing if there are outdated packages, like running um, pip outdated to see if there's you know new versions of packages. So maybe I want to recompile or I want to repen in my in file and recompile this text file. But I can run those now right from the command line. So I'll run this. If I do make compile, that actually runs inside the Docker container by uh, bind mounting the requirements directory into local. And then all my commands for the pip tools compile will refer to the local mount point instead of you know, having to reach out into the file system. So I don't copy those files in. And I do that with the minus minus rm because that just that's just ephemeral. It goes away as soon as it's all done, ready to go, easy to do. And now when I run make build, that will actually, well, I haven't changed anything. Let's actually add a new requirement. Uh, we'll add in hi yaml to our requirements file. Now, because we have modified requirements.in, we need to run our compile. That will output our new hashes. And then I can run make build. And that will now be detect that there was a change to the requirements.txt. And it's reinstalling uh, the pip uh, requirements file because there was a change. So now I've got PyYAML ready to go. Uh, if I run this Docker file, Actually, yeah, there it goes. So it's going to run the, um, it, it built it because it's diff it a different name. It didn't label it the same. But it's running the Python main.py, and you'll see the output, hi, PyCharm. So that all worked as expected. Uh, you can also set up your PyCharm, for example, to use that Docker interpreter 
that's inside the container for your environment. So if I go here, click on Docker, and I look for demo Docker latest, which is the one we're in, click OK. It will index the packages that are installed into that container specifically so that when I'm editing over here on my main.py, uh, so it's updating skeletons, if I do this, I'm waiting for it to finish. Scanning. There, request is now available for me to autocomplete. I don't have it installed locally. It's only installed inside that container. So if I do requests.get, it's it basically auto completes all of this for me, which is super nice from a development standpoint. Because PyCharm is aware of what's going on inside that container. I don't have to install anything locally. I could have no Python installed on my local machine and develop with Python and get the exact same versions of Python that I always need anywhere I'm at by using Docker. That is the like awesomely repeatable, super you know, simple, kind of like more I'm in production mode deploying libraries, deploying projects. We'll typically use Docker and pip tools and we can deploy into Fargate on Amazon or Lambda or serverless, you know, where they now support uh, containers uh, for that kind of work. And that is it. Um, that is the end. If there's questions, I haven't actually been watching over here at the uh, chat. So I don't know if there's folks who've got more questions. I would love to answer them. Here, I'll turn my camera back on. There we go. Uh, so, no, Joe, do you see more questions in there? Let's see. I, I have to dig back. I have a, I have a question. So I think yeah. you, you kind of answered this, but um, I just want to make sure, <clears throat> like if you use a Docker container uh, for running these, do you do you trust that that, that OS, you, you know, you, like that, that oh, the version of Python installed in the container, um, like it's a system level version of Python, but it's also got a, a, like an isolate, like it's also isolated. So I where don't. Do you draw I don't. Uh, so I didn't. I didn't show that off. But in our normal projects, we'll use Docker multi-stage builds, mm -hmm. and as part of that, what I do to make basically simplify the process of the multi-stage build is I'll create a virtual env inside the container, well, in, inside the image when I build it. I will install into that virtual environment. Well, I'll basically put it in my path first, so that when I, anytime I run a pip install, it's going into that virtual environment. In the second stage, which is like what the actual images that I will deploy into our container repository. I will copy from the virtual environment. Oh, I'll just basically copy that, like the end result of the virtual environment into my end uh, container. So I don't have to have all the build tools. I don't have GCC. I don't have any of that junk in my end container. It's only in that intermediary build container. And I use virtual environments to isolate off the piece that I want to build and then put into the, the end production bit that's going to run the real code. So if, if you have like, a virtual env that's going to run your code. Can you just like, like swap that whole directory in from the multi-stage yeah. build, or or is uh, and it will yeah. work? Or, or well, here I'll, I'll show you. I got I've got an example Docker file right here that I'm happy to kind of share. It may be a little small, but here we're using uh, three eight Sunbuster as a build. We install all the build junk, all the dang stuff that's needed to like get you know, database connectors and build essential packages. So, and then we, I use the Python 3 VM. So the Python from the container, I use it to create a virtual env in app. And then I set my path so that app bins first. And now after that, every operation that operates against that pip is actually operating against the virtual environment and not against the system Python. So I'm not even using system Python here. I'm still using a sandboxed version of Python that's been installed into slash app. So app will have a bin, a lib, a share, or whatever other things in there. No, oh, start my camera back up. I don't know why my camera's been failing. And then when we get down into like the, the final application image, like the, the end result, it's also 3.8 Slim Buster. So it's the same system Python that's, that's starting it up. But then I install the bare minimum things that are needed, just the end libraries, not the compile tools. And then from build, I just copy over that app directory. And then I copy into app all the remaining bits that are needed to run the app. So this is a Django app, uh, which lives in like Loud Swarm. And the config stuff, like the Django settings files are all in config and sources and source. So 
all that stuff runs on top of like what was pre-built uh, from before. It's very cool. It's the uh, it's really hard to come up with the best practices of how to um, put all the stuff together. And it's uh, these are some good recommendations um, for how to how to do all that. Um, let's see. Do we have any other questions while while we're we're going here? I, I guess one question for me: um, How do you see this stuff evolving? Like uh, I know you mentioned about a little bit about the uh like some of the other tools like pi project and poetry like they're all and set or like some of which like the pi project.yaml is uh tumble is um kind of like a python spec yeah it's coming along there's a if you look at the python packaging authority repository and github and, and it's kind of the related documentation they are starting some more build tools they maintain pip they maintain a new tool called build they maintain twine and those tools are all moving toward using pyproject.toml. And so right now in pyproject.toml, where you used to set up your you know, requires inside your setup.py, you can put those in pyproject.toml and that's that's safe to do. If you're doing an in project, like you've got a Django app you're getting ready to deploy, you're typically gonna have a requirements file still. You're not gonna use necessarily, a, you, you may use a pyproject.toml, but you won't be specifying your dependencies in there because your project dependencies are probably gonna be installed via requirements files. Mm -hmm. So that stuff's still coming along. I don't. I don't think it's fully baked and all there yet. I know the build tool is still in like beta or alpha builds. It, it works and it works for the pyproject.toml, but it's still. I, I and the thing about poetry is once you've kind of gone in on like poetry or pyenv, then you're you're invested in that tool for for building those things. And I kind of like just investing in what the Python packaging authority is going to support, which is pip at this point for installing. And pip compile just has an awesome resolver, uh, much mm -hmm. faster than the one from pip, much faster than one from pipenv, which is also under the Py PyPA, but I don't think it's well supported. I mean, I, I, well, maybe, I, maybe I misspoke there. It's certainly supported, but I just, I, I got frustrated with it because it was overly complex and too slow. Yeah. I've used poetry before, have had good results, but I also have been wanting to find like what the official blessed solution is. Yeah, um, and that's the problem. Like there's lots of opinions, right? And so finding an officially blessed solution, you're gonna have to find, I, I like the simple solution that's using the kind of out of the box tools. Like I'm not a lot of dependencies here. I don't have a lot of like cognitive overhead to learning another tool just to manage the dependencies for my project. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still really just pip. I'm just using pip compile to give me those hashes, that repeatability, all the version pens, so I can really, you know, sanely manage my dependencies and and make sure they're always up to date. Yeah, that that's a really nice nice uh, um, like the pip tools is a really nice suite. Um, yeah, I can see that the benefits of the simplicity with that. Um, I would just general question too. I don't see any in the in the in the chat unless anyone else. Uh, oh, let's see. How do you separate? I have one question here. How do you separate um, dev or test requirements from prod yeah. requirements? So I'll we'll, we'll have typically, I kind of showed a simple case of like a requirements.in. For our typical projects, we'll have a main.in, which are all the main dependencies of the project. And then we'll have a test.in or a prod.in, which only get in, but typically only get installed in the final container, like when it goes through CI and we build the actual containers there that get pushed in the repositories. Those will include prod.in, but not the test.in, and definitely not the local um, tools. So when you're developing locally, you can use build arguments to Docker to specify, you know, maybe devel equal true or devel equal yes. At that point, you can have some, some switches in your Docker file that install local and test, but not production, uh, for example, as far as requirements files. So we'll use those switches combined with multiple IN files. So we still have the lock files, well, kind of lock files, the hashes in the generated uh, compiled text files, mm -hmm. but they're separate and they, they get used in different cases. Like local development has local and main and test, but production is going to be main and prod. Interesting. Um, do you know if there's a PyEnv that uh, like an option to not compile like from source um, the, uh, the oh. Python version? Um, I would just curious i i don't know i don't think so um personally I, I i want that compiled from source because maybe i've got for example readline installed and i want to make sure i get those niceties from the the REPL. Mm -hmm. 
Um, a, a compiled from source version or a pre-compiled like binary may not have that. And then you're kind of at the whim of whoever's producing that binary. Mm -hmm. When you saw during my demo, I, I installed 396, you know, live and on a modern machine yeah. doesn't take that long. It, yeah, it was actually pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, yeah, that was an excellent talk. Um, <clears throat> really, uh, really appreciate seeing, um, seeing how, um, how you do things and uh, uh, learn about learning about some really cool uh, tools in the Python ecosystem because it's something that um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of information about and yeah have it distilled down is really helpful. No, I I love doing these you know kind of call it intro talks, but I I learn something every time I go through these. I've been doing Python for good lord far too long to probably even mention on air, uh, but I love kind of keeping my tools sharp, making sure the system's clean, making sure that it's always a pleasure. When I step up to my computer, I'm ready to solve a problem. So uh, before we uh, end, end the official talk portion, uh, do you have any uh, like calls to action for, for the community regarding anything? I stay involved in the community, stay involved in meetups, go to the conferences. And Andy mentioned that, you know, that was a great stepping point off point for him is going to PyCon. And he's been a fanatic ever since. Um, I, I same for me. I totally love being involved in this community. Everyone is approachable. There's not a person at a conference you can't just walk up to and ask a question. They're all very approachable. Yeah, that's it's it's an amazing community. I can't mm -hmm. wait to meet person again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> me too. Well, uh, um, so that basically concludes our our talks. Um, and. Uh, you know, I would like to like I'd, I'd like to thank all of our our speakers and our sponsors and all of the viewers viewers of course um, and IndiePie for uh, for this collaboration. Um, uh, Calvin, do you have anything to say um, as well as well? Or? Uh, so we'll have the door prize drawing. We will if you are registered on meetingplace.io/indiePie, we will do the drawing based off of the RSVP list there and notify you of your PyCharm professional license. Uh, I think that's kind of it for IndiePie. We um, had a social last night uh, locally, so we're starting to do a couple of at least one in-person event, and we'll probably do another one next month. Very cool. It's good to good to see that that's coming back. Starting slowly. Yeah. Um, the night doesn't have to end. Uh, there's a um, if you want to join us at uh, Chippy Town or H HTTP colon slash slash not HTTPS unfortunately uh, it will redirect you to a gather town workspace which um, uh, you can come and hang out and um, just talk about Python or mm -hmm. um, for anyone who's interested so feel free to join that um, but uh, yeah thanks everyone for joining and um, and see you next time cool thank you. <laughs>